hate to kick a man while he's down, but it is a lot easier. Uh, Brexit derangement syndrome live show. The, the accounts of affliction of an affluent and evil. So I'm not actually going to talk about what's currently going on with Brexit, I'm going to talk about what's happening around it. There's a bunch of problems with Sargon's approach to Brexit. Denialism, failure to seemingly make any kind of point or provide any kind of reason why it's a good idea, just some vague, emotional, feel-good stuff about sovereignty, which represents a, a misunderstanding of it. But I think immediately on the title of this talk, we can see a huge problem that he's facing. In the, if it's the affluent and the able who are against Brexit, and Sargon believes in meritocracy, that the best people do and should rise to the highest levels. So something I uh, agree with in principle, but differently in implementation. Then if those successful and able and educated people are overwhelmingly against Brexit, it rather suggests that it's a terrible idea. I mean, who's happy with the deal? <laughs> If you're pro-Brexit, Theresa May's deal is about as good of a deal as you can expect, and it's still going to be ruinous on par with the 2008 Great Recession, whereas crashing out with no deal will be two to three times as bad. Conservative estimates suggest that 10% of the economy will be lost over the next few years if we went through a no-deal Brexit. May's deal is also the only one with even a rat carcass in Battersea Dog's home chance of getting through. <laughs> and there is actually something called Brexit anxiety disorder, at least according to two scientists who spoke to Politico. They say that uh, far from being hyper-rational, observers are uh, concerned with only what's economically sensible, instead they've morphed into the Romaniacs of Brexit disdain. They are acting no differently to what psychologists would expect from those suffering from chronic anxiety caused by a loss of control and insecurity to professors, say, one from the University of London and one of clinical psychologists. They apparently have slipped into polarizing in and out groups, seeking solace in the demonization of the other with whom they blame for the current state of affairs. Fear and anxiety can be rational responses when you're under threat. And these are the people, the, the high information voters, if you will, who have always been cognizant of the massively deleterious effect that Brexit is going to have both personally, professionally, economically, not just on them, but everyone. And yeah, they have more to lose than a lot of people. They're in a position to better exploit the opportunities that the EU has represented, but they're also not the ones who are actually going to suffer the most. That is going to be the poor and working class of Britain, as this may well push us back into austerity. All the EU development money will dry up, and if you think the Tories are going to invest that in run-down industrial northern areas, then uh, you've got another thing coming. Business, academia, and not even soft academia, science, technology, all of these arenas are all lined up against this, as are most of Britain's biggest employers, particularly the automotive and the service sectors. Fear as rational, distaste for people who have made an emotional decision to leave is understandable also. From the city said, it's broken the social contract. We all paid the taxes which propped them up and now they've gone and fucked us. <laughs> <laughs> so fuck them. They're fine, but they're screwed. That's the kind of inconsistency that they're talking about. They fucked us, we'll be fine. There's a huge gulf of a difference between being fine and prospering. All they mean is that they're in a position better equipped to weather the storm than this 
surge of emotion-led, nationalistic, working-class and underclass outrage. But that that's all they mean. Because the people who are going to be fucked the most by Brexit are the people who voted for it, ironically enough. This isn't entirely their fault. Low information voters isn't an insult, it's an accurate description of people who have been propagandised to and lied to by the Murdoch press and successive governments blaming Europe for all their ills for the past decades. But anger, I think, is, is justified. It's just a little unfair, perhaps, but it's still understandable. And another gag, really. Uh, senior figures laugh and joke about uh, the stupidity of the country voting to leave. Brexit was like a cancerous tumour which had to be surgically removed from the EU. One prominent official said, in Westminster's bars and restaurants, MPs often talk of the catastrophe, the humiliation, and the nightmare inflicted upon them. I have one response to this. <laughs> There is no doubt that British politics is broken. I mean, one of the other ultimate ironies in all this is that the EU is far more democratic than the UK political system is. And there are problems with our political class in that it chooses politicians, you know, our, our system, rather than choosing people who are actually good at anything. But even so, they know overwhelmingly by a huge majority these people that we return to Parliament to represent us, to watch out for us, to lead. They know this is an enormous shit show. And yet, due to our broken political system, it's still going ahead. Thanks to Theresa May's perverse stubbornness to deliver something that has no real mandate and what mandates it had has dissolved away in recent weeks and months. The system's broken, but even so, the experts, political experts, know it's a disaster too. So why did you do it, Why did you do it? Why did you do it? And the answer is, well, we all know. And the Huffington Post is quite readily going to tell you, it's because you're racist. You're all racist. And I know you don't think you're a racist, because, according to the man who wrote this, Nobody knows. No individual believes himself to be racist, just as no society thinks it's racist. It's all dog whistles from here on out, apparently. In most cases, it isn't racism. But there is racism involved. There is xenophobia involved. There is a kind of ennui about Islam and about Polish workers and all, all the rest of it. You know, the, the facts don't matter, though. These people are the other, somehow. That's what worries people. There's ideas that don't necessarily hold water, that these people take more than they contribute, which isn't true, and so on, that they put a stretch on services, which is kind of true, but they also provide the bulk of those services. So that doesn't really work as a criticism either. Yeah, but there, there is a racial or a nationalistic animus to this. And there is no getting around that. It's just racism might be too strong of a word. One need only look at Daily Mail headlines for the past few years to see that this is definitely an element. And so Britain and Europe come to, the terms, uh, come to terms with the fact that racism is a fundamental and not incidental aspect of their societies, as America is only now beginning to realise, the hatred of the other will continue, as well as its nefarious results, and whether they take place on election day or on the streets. Well, I think we may as well check that, because we can actually see if Britain is a racist country or not. For example, are the Brits okay to live next to the races? Yes. <laughs> Are the French okay to listen to this? Fuck the French. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, 
On the surface of it, this seems like, like a good point, but this is generalised for the whole country. Britain is very much concentrated in its urban centres, and these are much more multicultural, and these are also places where people have far less problem with the idea of immigrants or, or mixing with other races and so on. This was shown in examinations of the Brexit data that showed that people who considered immigration or Islam and other things similar to that to be a big problem were people who lived far away <laughs> from any of that and people who lived next door to, around and with these other communities, they were far more accepting. So there's a city and rural split here. It's one that makes us look better overall, but when you really drill down, there's just nothing there. Now, it's a little unfair to conflate racism with concerns about immigration or perfectly justifiable concerns about importing thousands of unreformed Islamists into the country, but I think we can admit that even while we can make those separations, these issues and bigotry are intertwined. It's complicated. So we ended up doing implicit bias tests, and once again, the French are massively racist, but you can drop Italy and Portugal. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, we can actually be sure that Britain is not a racist country. Implicit bias tests are bullshit. Even academia has, has caught on to that one, so I don't think it makes much sense to use them to bolster your argument here particularly since you've debunked them yourself in the past. Apparently, directly off the Brexit, there was a 57% increase in hate crimes. Now, that sounds bad until you realise that that's double figures. 33 whole reports in 72 hours. It's a catastrophe, the country will never be the same. Yes, that's a, a bad argument, the statistics aren't terribly compelling in terms of numbers and so on. Anecdotally though, there are plenty of reports of various people being made to feel unwelcome, nothing that would rise to the level of a crime, and of course anecdote is not data. But there's a sufficient whiff about the place, one I've personally encountered, even for non-EU immigrants. That I think there's there's um there's smoke here at least. So why do people actually vote for Brexit? <laughs> <laughs> Stop retracing. Okay, I think it's one of my this. So they actually vote for Brexit because of the three musketeers here. <laughs> <laughs> on your I suppose we left, um, no, on your right screen, uh, we have Alexander Macron, the Führer of France. <laughs> Considering the extent to which the Guillaume has been infiltrated and steered by the far right, comparing Macron, a fairly liberal, fairly progressive leader who was trying to put through environmental measures, comparing him to Hitler seems a, a trifle distasteful. Now why do people vote for Brexit? Someone shouted sovereignty. We never lost any sovereignty, we were a participant in a larger structure. We retained all manner of vetoes. We agreed with, I hear, over 90% of the rulings that were made in the European Union. This sovereignty, this is an irrational feel-good word that has been bandied about. I've been on a quest to find a reason why people voted for Brexit that wasn't either parochial or just wrong, as the sovereignty argument is, and I haven't found anything yet. The closest to a good reason is parochial reasons, people from fishing communities. But fishing accounts for less than half a percent of the UK economy, whereas the service sector, which is going to be devastated, is far, far bigger. So, according to Lord Ashcroft's polling after the Brexit vote, Brexit has actually voted for, in order, sovereignty, immigration control, and because of the lack of influence within the European Union, but for good fine reasons. Brown people were not actually a reason that anyone voted for Brexit. Neither were foreigners, actually. Just the, the, I think. Sovereignty is only lost when you are an imperial holding of another power that makes your rulings for you. When you participate, 
when you're a, a big and an important participant, when you have veto rights, when there's democracy, when your views are represented by your representatives, you cannot be said to have lost sovereignty. Immigration, that reason is going to include the racists and the xenophobes and people with more rarefied and intelligent reasons to have issues with immigration, not that they stand to scrutiny, they're just not racist or xenophobic. And as to influence, we had enormous influence as one of the largest economies in the European Union. We used it to stand in the way to prevent progress. We were a blockade on many of the ambitions of the European Union. We were a halt to progress. Risks look too great regarding the economy and jobs, the status quo is apparently the best of both worlds, and the feeling that they'd be isolated, which I found really interesting, because it's not like we're going to build a war. <laughs> we already have a moat. <laughs> <laughs> if you compare the reasons given for remain to the reasons given for leave, you'll see there is a stark contrast between the two. The reasons for leave tend to be first order thinking, uh, reflexive, reactionary. I don't like immigrants. I don't think we have enough of a say. I think we're being ruled over. None of these are true. None of these are really rational, that they're feelings based. Whereas you look at the reasons for remain and they're pragmatic, they're practical, they're more intellectual, they're broader. They are second order thinking. It's worth just briefly pointing out on the immigration issue that we have always had control over immigration from Europe. We've just chosen not to use it and then to blame Europe. How did the Remainers take it? <laughs> not well. <laughs> In fact, the, the mass middle class protests have been a prime hotbed of cringe. You can see by the lady here emoting. <laughs> You've got a lot of signs like this, pants to Brexit, which maybe makes me think that they're dealing with real issues that they're really upset by. I went to one of the pro-EU marches shortly after the original vote. I didn't attend the larger one. However, the one I went to was a huge mix of people of different classes. And in fact, that was something really impressive about it, that it was so broad. There were scientists, teachers, people who'd settled here from the EU. Yeah, I, I talked to quite a lot of them. And 700,000, over 700,000 people attended the pro-EU rally more and more recently. And to think that every single one of those was a privileged middle-class hipster is, is arrogant in the extreme. Whereas the pro-Brexit march didn't even make one-tenth of that numbers and was possibly outnumbered by a counter-protest. And why would anyone take the biggest act of self-sabotage since the Suez Crisis? Well, why would they take their livelihoods being threatened? Well, why would they take their families potentially being broken up? Well, why would anyone take this well? And there is an identity that people have as European citizens, particularly younger people, that's being taken away from them. And so an emotional reaction to that is just as profound and just as likely as your emotional reaction to your imagined threat to Britishness is. As someone who's just had their livelihood severely threatened, you'd think you might have a little more sympathy for people. This was one of my favourites. You can't ignore us, we're the 48 cent. <laughs> Actually, it means we can ignore you. <laughs> There's a popular saying that democracy is two wolves and a sheep voting on what's for dinner. That's not democracy. That is ochlocracy. That is mob rule. And mob rule is closer to what we get with this referendum. Such a tiny, vanishingly small majority 
on such a drastic level of constitutional change in a purely advisory vote marred by breathtaking lies and massive illegality cannot be any sort of mandate for this level of destruction certainly not a clean brexit as some people call it you know without a deal a no deal brexit it's certainly not for that and polling shows this that remain now has an 18 point lead in the polls way way beyond any margin of error which is typically three to five percent way beyond that if it's may's deal or remain people are very much for remain and a no deal brexit is out of the question but a democracy has protections for minorities from the mob and in this case it's a pretty fucking huge minority and now a majority they're not big on democracy they think the voting is part of tyranny the majority votes that it's always uh the, sorry Brexit is racist, a majority vote that destroys minority rights and freedoms, that's not democracy, it's the road to tyranny. So Odd as that may sound, it's actually accurate. It's one of the distinctions, one of the main distinctions between democracy and ochlocracy. Mob rule, the protections for minorities, the existence of a representative class to make these kinds of decisions that protect people sometimes against the will of the majority. I mean, until very recently, a majority in the UK were for the death penalty, but successive governments and parliaments had voted it down in order to protect people. And that made perfect sense, and that's democracy working as it should. Populism, nationalist populism, threatens that. So speaking of tyranny... <laughs> What exactly are we escaping? Well, we're escaping an economic project. I'm not convinced that locking oneself away in one's room with one's toys, much diminished amount of toys, it must be said, can really be called escaping from anything. And the EU has always been more than just an economic project. The point he then labours about the EU army. It was never going to go ahead while we were part of the EU because we were so dead set against it and would have vetoed any attempt to do so. Now that it looked, looks like we're leaving, they're pressing forward with that. And does that make sense? Yes, as a cost-cutting measure. I don't know why people find the idea of a European army sinister any more than they find, say, NATO sinister. Uh, it, saves money, saves logistics, saves all kinds of issues, and that means more money for everybody. Why not just become a major sovereign power? I mean, you're going to be nothing that kind of thing. If you want to become an empire, <laughs> which Guy Vin Hofstadt called for in 2016, and the French finance minister reiterated this month, why are they using the term empire? If I had to hazard a guess, it's because English isn't their first language and because the terms that we have for multinational, international groups coming together don't necessarily apply that well. Alliance doesn't really work. Federation, perhaps, if we get to that point. Community, maybe. None of these have the kind of pomp and weight and appeal to history and nostalgia that the idea of empire does. Now, I think that's a dangerous thing to be invoking. I don't think they should be using that term. Just look at how Brexit has been empowered by British nostalgia for empire, which has led us to ruin just as it did in Suez. <laughs> Um, obviously, post Brexit can be chaos. Within two weeks, there will be no Mars bars on the entire island. No! He cherry picks a whole bunch of somewhat hyperbolic examples here, but it's quite hard to be hyperbolic about how awful 
the aftermath of a no-deal Brexit would be. And again, there is consensus amongst everybody in the know that this is going to be the case. Kent turned into a lorry park, everyone agrees, governments made provisions for it. The NHS is now the single largest, highest purchaser of refrigeration units in the UK at the moment, which has made a rather nice Christmas for refrigerator manufacturers. Why? Because they're stockpiling perishable medicines in case for no-deal Brexit. Supply chain will be broken down. Everything will be uncertain. Flights may be stopped. The costs of doing business will immediately go up. So it's not project fear. I mean, we've got cabinet ministers who are pro-Brexit preparing for the worst and pumping another £2 billion into preparation. Troops on the streets. Yeah, this is going to be awful if it happens. So, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> but of all the terrible things that can befall this country, surely the cancellation of Love Island is going to be the most painful. And I'd like to say, good input, Jess Phillips. That was her point. Look, these are risible, and it is easy to make fun of them, but the reason for these stupid examples is that people, reporters, are trying to make the effects of a no-deal Brexit relatable. It's all very well saying, oh, 10% of the economy will be wiped out. What, what does that mean to the average person? Not a great deal. But if you tell them that the price of strawberries is going to go up because there will be no EU pickers from Romania or Poland to come and pick them and Brits won't do the work at a, at a low wage, or if you tell them that the supply chain disruption means they might not be able to get their particular favourite food, that's something people can relate to and understand and latch on to in exactly the same way as a lot of the bullshit stories about European regulation caught on, you know, the whole bananas thing that was bullshit in that case. Anyway, Mervyn King, the ex-governor of the Bank of England, thinks that we should just take the 39 billion and do a run. <laughs> and he said this back in 2016. It's a good idea because apparently Brexit's not really going to cause any problems. But again, what does he know? The Guardian East is no more. Yeah, what what do they know compared to a couple of cherry-picked people? Guardianistas. <laughs> oh, and the TUC, and most MPs, and all the former Prime Ministers, and a coalition of tech firms, and the NHS, and the banking sector as a whole, and the automotive industry as a whole, and the service sector as a whole, and leading and important agricultural bodies, the education sector, Mark Carney and the, and the Bank of England, and on and on and on and on. But you've got two people, and Trump, so I, I guess that makes all the difference. I think that uh, turning out the table was he says, free from EU rules, Britain will automatically revert to world trade using rules agreed by the World Trade Organization. It works pretty well for Australia. So why on earth would it not work to work just as well for the world's fifth largest economy? Let's well, you're in dire straits indeed if you're looking to Tony Abbott for advice on anything. He was an um, archly conservative PM of Australia, and he took an axe to all manner of important regulations and protections and so on entered into the kind of international free trade agreements that you're against which the EU represents and so forth and this is basically what he's advocating for the UK and what a lot of other hardline Brexiteers are advocating for the UK that we become a kind of offshore Singapore for Europe by taking an axe to our regulations and protections and everything else. And Singapore, for all its bright, shiny, modern and clean, isn't really a model of freedom for the world. We have everything that we need to go forward. We just need to be brave enough to tell Europeans to get fucked. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's disheartening, Sargon, to see you turn your back on the scepticism that made you what you were originally. To see you slide to the right, don't think it's entirely your fault. You've been placed in an echo prison, somewhat against your will, I think, and haven't been exposed to other points of view, but you're not applying scepticism and criticism to Brexit. It's it's a it's a singular glaring failure of yours. Ever since that, that first talk with Thunderfoot, it's been obvious that you have no idea about it at all. And you've fallen in with a very bad company when it comes to UKIP. Now, I think Tommy Robinson gets a bit of a raw deal, though he isn't exactly the uh, the best figure, and the people that support him aren't necessarily the best people. But still, it's representative of where this slide has taken you. It's a very dangerous game you're playing in trying to say that a no-deal Brexit will be fine. It's fueling fires of people who will regard anything else, May's deal, let alone the sensible option, which is to still remain. It's feeding into them, seeing them as traitors. There was a person with a mock gallows, for Christ's sake, at your little march. Yeah, and someone was shot during the actual vote campaign. Now, there's no direct calls for violence, but the rhetoric around traitors is dangerous. And to anyone who has studied the interwar years in Europe, it should also be very, very concerning. Show a little more scepticism. And if you've got a reason for Brexit that stands up to scrutiny and isn't parochial, let's hear it. I didn't write any jokes about it because I couldn't use them in the show and monetize the work I've done, right? So I haven't <laughs> written any jokes about Brexit because I didn't see the point of committing to a course of action for which there's no logical or financial justification. 